Many of the plants and trees that grow all around us were essential for the survival of ancient populations that lived in these areas. Today I'm going to see how many I can find and see if I can even put them to use using the same methods that were used hundreds of years ago by the populations that lived here. And that's coming up. All right, we have made our way down to the river now and we're actually getting into some really good plant and tree habitat. So we've got lapine blooming, we've got all kinds of wildflowers all around us, so it's just a great setup down here. You know, these willow trees were used for so many different purposes by the ancient Americans that lived here. They were used for bows and for arrows. They were actually even strong enough to be used for harpoon lines for sea lions for the coastal tribes. They were used for cordage, for uh, baskets, for fish traps, for fishing line, for all kinds of different purposes that were just essential. Another one of the most common uses for these willow trees was to use them for their fire drills and the fire boards when they were making their hand drill fires and bow and drill fires. Willow trees were used for all kinds of different things. One of the most common uses was to actually build fish fences intended for herding and corralling fish into their fish traps. And the way that they would do this is they would take the stakes, the cuttings from these trees, and they would drive them down into the water, right down into the ground, and the cuttings would actually start to grow their own roots to stabilize them and keep them from being washed away downstream. They would become strong enough that the Native Americans could actually walk out on the tops of the fences to gather the fish and for all kinds of other purposes. So we've got our willow tree, and I just wanted to demonstrate real quick uh, one of the most common usages for this particular tree, which was cordage. So if you've got a nice, big, long piece here, you don't want to start all the way at the very tip top. Uh, most of the time this is just going to be too flimsy. It's not going to give you the right cordage that you need. So you're going to go ahead and make a nice clean break. Now what you see you're left with, if you've got all these little branches, you need to get rid of those, but you need to get rid of them without pulling down. If you start pulling down on these, it's going to start stripping the bark. It's going to make a big mess. So what you want to do is you want to pick them off nice and clean. Best method I've used for that is just to get your thumb in there really tight right at the base of it. And then instead of pulling it down, you're going to break it off to the side and then you see how it's starting to peel down. You don't want that. So you're going to try to pull it up and off. So I'm just going to work my way down the tree and we're getting nice clean breaks. Going up and then off. So now we go back up to the top. You can see how we've already got a nice little start here where the bark has been peeled away. We want to see if we can get this into two nice clean strips. Okay, so you can see how we've got it down into two strips on either side. We don't want to be tempted to start pulling down. If we start pulling down, it's going to start ripping as we get to each one of these breaks. We want to pull straight out or up, and we've got them in these two nice strips here. And now we can start working our way carefully using our thumbs to strip it away. And we are not pulling down. We're pulling it towards us and we are pulling it out because again if we start pulling it down we're going to run into some breaks as we get to where those branches were. Every once in a while we're going to feel around it make sure we're getting it all so it doesn't break into three or four pieces on us. All right, so we've got our willow tree now and we've got the bark stripped off of it in this section where we were working. We could use this cordage for a fish trap, we could use it for a snare, and it's all ready to go into the next phase. Okay, so the next step in the process is we have stripped off the willow bark from the willow tree and we want to make cordage now. But we can't just use the bark as it is to make really good cordage. What we want to do is we want to strip off this dark green outer layer. This is a dense basalt rock that we can use to scrape off the dark green layer. 
and get to this nice light green layer that we can split off and use for cordage. All right, so what we've got here is we've got the inner willow bark that we have processed. And our main goal was just to get into two main strands. And so we started this off by tying it to a willow limb just to give us a little bit of attention. And we have two strands on each side that we're just kind of working down. And then as we start getting down, it starts to thin out in places here and there. And so what we do when we get to a part like that is we go ahead and take some of the finer strands that we peeled off and we just start working them in. Now you can see as this wrap is happening, the twist between the thumb and the forefinger is happening clockwise, but the wrap is actually happening counterclockwise. It's a pinch, a twist clockwise, and then a wrap counterclockwise. And you see as we get to a thin part, we're going to go ahead and take some of these smaller strands that we've peeled off, and we're going to go ahead and just start bringing them right in. All the while, we're still just ending up with our two main strands, but when we start to thin out a little bit, it's okay to grab some thinner stuff and start bringing it back in to, to bulk up your strands to give it a little bit more strength. You see the clockwise on the twist, counterclockwise on the wrap. Now as we're working our way through this, you can see that we're always keeping tension on the willow branch. We want to keep the line nice and taut or it's going to be really hard to work with and it's going to start to get sloppy. You can see now as we get down to the end of the cordage, it starts to get thinner and thinner. And we want to make sure we're finishing this off with a nice knot. That way it doesn't start to unravel on us. All right, what we've got here now is the very beginning of some fishing line. And so what we'd like to eventually end up with is probably about 20 feet or so of this. We might even add a, a five or six foot leader to it. To do that, we most likely won't use the willow. We'll probably go to something a little bit more fine like stinging nettle. Uh, but you can see that this is, this is really well made. This is very strong. And um, you know, I, I put it to a pretty good test and, and this is all my strength trying to break it. And I cannot even budge it. I cannot pull it apart. And so I know that this is gonna be strong enough to bring in anything that we wanna fish for. You know, one of the things that's great about this, this is just the beginning of the line, and so we can keep adding to it and adding to it. All we gotta do is untie the knots again and just jump right back into the process. So now that we've got all the bark stripped off of this branch of this willow tree, there's a couple things we might choose to do with it. One thing we might choose to do is to split it right down the middle. That's gonna make it a little bit more versatile in case we wanna do some other things with it that might be a little bit more lightweight, that might require a more pliable, flexible material. One example of this might be, let's say we wanted to make a smaller fish trap. Let's say we wanted to make a basket and we needed something that we could weave in and out. Uh, this would be perfect for that. So we're gonna go ahead and split this down and show you. We've got some willows that we're stripping the bark off of and we're just kind of working our way up so that we can split these in half. What we're after here is more pliable, flexible pieces of material that we could use for basketry or fish traps. Now you can see one of the important things here is as it's splitting is that the very top of the crack it wants to veer off one way or the other and so what we do when we come to a point like that you can see it's starting to veer off to the left a little bit. So we're going to put more stress on the right side by holding the left side still and putting more pressure on the right side trying to get the very tip of that split back into the center of the branch. And you'll see that that'll happen uh, a few times as we're going about the process. As long as you're watching the very top and making sure that it doesn't veer off too far and get too thin on one side, you'll have two nice pieces to work with by the time you get to the end. So one of the things that I wanted to accomplish in coming out today was just to do something in the same way that it was done hundreds of years ago. So we found our willow tree, we stripped off the bark, we're gonna use it for cordage, and then what we did is we took that stripped off piece of the willow tree and we made a nice even split. I mean, it's almost perfectly symmetrical right down the middle. So one of the reasons that we did this is because this could be used for a lot of things. You can see here, this is a much more flexible piece of wood than if we had just kept the piece of the tree itself in a whole form. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and keep these for later. 
We might use them for a future project, might use them for a basket or a fish trap or whatever we choose to make. We got them all tied up with the bark. They came from our willow tree limb. And if these dry out, we can just re-soak them to make them pliable again. into a spot just now that has pretty much everything I was hoping to get into today. We have so many of the different plants and trees that were so resourceful and useful for ancient populations all in this one small area. Uh, this really is an amazing area that we came into. I guess the reason why it's so unique is we have so many of our favorite plants and trees right here in this same area. They're our favorites because they're so resourceful, so useful. There's so many different things we can do with them. I mean all here just in one spot we've got snowberry, we've got nine bark, Oregon grape is right here. We've got a mock orange. We've got another nine bark. We've got a willow tree coming up. There's an Indian plum here right in front of us. We've got a big western red cedar tree and we've even got the scouring rush all around us. So I'm excited that we came across some of this scouring rush. Um, it's always been one of my favorite plants. It was very heavily utilized by ancient populations. This is something that we've actually used quite a bit in working with tools. We've used it for sandpaper. It had just all kinds of different uses. One of the things that it was used for is it was actually used to extract the juices from and then that was mixed with water to make a treatment for poison ivy. And the very tops of the plant were dried and they would mix with salmon eggs and it would be consumed just as food. And then also the dried root stalks were also edible and used for food. The so scouring rush was a great sanding tool. We've used it for our own bows and arrows that we've made, any type of wood tool that we've worked with that we wanted to make smooth. We have used this and it is definitely comparable to any fine sandpaper that you could find. Aside from only using it for wooden tools, it was also used for bone tools. You know, this scouring rush is actually strong enough that it can be used to polish bone. It makes it very shiny, it can make it very smooth, and the grit on it is even strong enough to sharpen uh, certain tools made out of bone and of course out of wooden tools as well. One of my favorite uses that this was used for by Native American tribes was actually the children would use this as a whistle. And uh, the parents would sometimes tell them not to blow the whistle because they said it was going to attract snakes, but maybe they were making it up because the whistle was driving them crazy. So one of the more common uh, shrub trees that I was hoping to come across that we have here is nine bark. And nine bark was used for all kinds of things. One of the main purposes that it was used for was it was used as a brown dye. The straighter shoots were used for um, arrow making. It was also used as an emetic in case they ever ingested poison. They would boil it up, turn it into a tea, and then they would consume it with large quantities of water to help get the poison out. One of my favorite uses that this was used for though is they would actually use it to make children's bows for practice bows. We found in our experience that it can actually be used as cordage. It's not going to be quite as strong as your willows or your cottonwood bark would be for cordage, uh, but for some of the light duty stuff you can definitely get away with using nine bark. And this is Oregon grape. Um, it has edible berries on it and the Native American tribes would actually use the root and the bark to make a yellow dye. This is mock orange. Mock orange is another common shrub tree and it grows about 8 to 10 feet. Its shoots were used by Native American tribes for fine coiled baskets. It was used for all kinds of things. They would use it for snowshoes, use it for making fish spears and digging sticks. It was used to make arrows and it was actually even used to make arrowheads. It was also used in times of war, in battle, as a type of battle armor to protect them. This is a dogwood tree. This had all kinds of different uses for Native American tribes. First of all, the fruit was edible on it. They could use it for arrow making, for bows. They'd use it for baskets, for fish traps, and even for making fish nets. This grows into about a 10 to 12 foot tree, and they could make fish hooks out of this by using the bigger branches that come off of the tree. Native Americans would use this in times of war to extract a poison from it to put on the tips of their arrowheads to make the wounds more deadly. This is Queen Anne's Lace. It has an edible root. It's not native to North America, but it is an ancestor of the carrot. And we are going to dig it up. We've got a deer antler. We're just going to pry this in and we're going to wiggle it and we're going to do that all around the entire plant. This is the Queen Anne's Lace. And you can see the shape of this antler makes it really easy. It makes a T so you can grip it on both sides and it has a curve, a natural curve to it. 
wiggle. Okay, you can get underneath it and you're gonna pry it up. And it looks like we got the whole thing and it actually does smell just like a carrot. And we will get that cleaned up and add it to the rest of our collection. So one of the trees that was definitely on my checklist today that I wanted to find was a crab apple tree. Crab apple trees were very useful to ancient Native American tribes. And one of my objectives for the day in coming out here was to try to identify as many plants and trees as I could, and then also to see if I could even put into use some of those plants and trees. This crab apple tree is gonna be the perfect opportunity to do that. Crab apple trees were used for so many things, including digging sticks. And so we're gonna go ahead and cut a section of this. I've got a couple of chisels with me. We've got a deer and elk bone that we can use. We've got a chisel here made out of yew wood. It's got a jasper stone on the end and it's wrapped with split cedar roots. So we're gonna take a section of this and see if we can make a digging stick. One of the reasons we were so excited to come across this patch of crab apple trees is because it was so heavily relied upon by Native American tribes. The fruit was a major source of food for them. It would be eaten fresh, it would also be dried and stored throughout the winter months. Aside from being a major food source, these were also used as a salmon gaff for salmon fishing. They were used as spear prongs and they were also used as halibut hooks. All right, we've cut off our little section of our crab apple tree. Uh, we used a couple of chisels to get that out and uh, now we're working on it with an adze. This adze is made out of vine maple, and the cordage that goes around it is made out of stinging nettle. So we have our cut that we did here from the crab apple tree, and this is our digging stick that we're gonna use. Before we start actually digging with it though, we wanna fire harden it. So today we're gonna make a nice fire, we're gonna go with the hand drill method, and it's gonna take a few minutes of this in the fire to get it nice and hard and ready to dig with. So just for the fun of it, we decided to go ahead and transfer it into a fire carrier first. This is just made out of cedar tinder and cedar bark, and it'll buy you all kinds of time to get your fire ready the way you want it to go. We're gonna go ahead and lay this down and finish getting our fire prepped up, and then we'll ignite our fire.
So I've been out here making this video um, pretty much most of the day. I got about halfway through the day and I started thinking, you know, what is it that gets me so excited about this? Like, what am I doing right now? Why am I walking around with this camera, taking shots of plants, common plants, common trees, uh, things that we see every single day? What am I doing walking around and filming these things? And why is it that I get so excited about it? And um, the first answer that I came up with when I started thinking about it was I, it just makes me feel good. I like coming out in nature. I like seeing the plants and the trees. But I think there's actually more to it than that. I think it has something to do with being connected. There's a bald eagle. Ah, oh, that would have been a good shot. Um, is being connected to our history and the peoples that lived here. And um, just thinking about them being here and knowing how heavily they relied on all these things. And it was just an everyday way of life for them. The thought of coming down here, coming out into the wild, not only finding those plants and trees that they revered so much, but actually being able to put them to use the same way they did, it's like it connects me to history somehow. I've always had this passion for the way that people lived hundreds of years ago and seeing if I could replicate what they did. Not only using the same materials that they used, but I want to do it in an authentic way. I want to see if I can do it you know, in the same method that they did. Because the plants and the trees haven't changed. They still grow the same way as they did hundreds of years ago. The way I think about it in my mind is that I should be able to do it the same way that they did. And you know, not only with plants and trees, but you know, anything, wh whether it's making fires or building shelters or whatever it is, I'm interested in doing those things the way that they were done anciently. That's what gives me that, that personal rush, is to, to challenge myself. I get excited when I see these common plants and trees because when I see it, I don't see just the tree. I don't see just the plant or just the root. I see it for what it was and how it was used hundreds of years ago by uh, populations that lived here. You know, to walk across these, these rock beds and to see artifacts and tools for me to know that that was handled by Native American tribes that walked on this very ground and they use these very plants and trees, that, that fills me up. That gives me a big rush. I'd rather do this than just about anything I can think of. You can majorly support our channel just by hitting the like button and subscribing.